we're intending to oh, we are intending to uh, extend this uh, um, uh, research uh, into uh, several other directions. So stay tuned for future um, uh, uh, progress. And uh, as you can see from the title page, I put a uh, fireworks. So uh, I hope I, in the end of the talk, I will convince you that uh, um, uh, just sort of look more like a fireworks that uh, you have uh, streams of uh, fireworks and then explosion in the end. And then now our task is to understand uh, throughout all these uh, uh, explosions, uh, what is happening uh, in details of this firework uh, mechanism. And uh, uh, so here's the outline of my talk. Uh, so just in case uh, people don't know why I mean by hazardization, I will define it um, sort of more concretely in terms of uh, the microscopic models that connect partons to hadrons instead of uh, some other uh, objects that uh, we will uh, use to uh, study hadronization. And uh, in this work, we emphasize that uh, um, there are two key features that we would like to capture in order to uh, uh, concretely quantify what we mean by uh, hadronization studies. So we will look into flavor and energy flow. So uh, uh, particles uh, along some uh, jet direction you will see. And uh, so when you talk about hadronization studies, it's kind of vague. And, uh, but in this work, we uh, pin down a very specific system, which is the leading and next to leading hadrons. And then I'm going to convince you that this system is sort of interesting and then actually directly gives us some intrinsic features of hadronization. And then uh, the observable we are going to look at is uh, generally called charge correlation. But it's really just a two particle correlation of leading and next to leading hadrons. And I will uh, talk about that uh, uh, in more details later. And in this work, uh, there's no calculations. So there are simulations from PCI and Hurry. And then you can, uh, 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 of course, uh, 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 understand this because there's no systematic uh, 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 reliable calculation for non perturbative physics yet. So. At the moment, hadronizations all rely on modeling. So uh, we pick uh, two distinct uh, simulation, simulations. Uh, one is Pythia, the other one is Herwick. And uh, uh, either of them uh, will uh, implement some hadronization model that are sort of conceptually different. And then uh, we will be able to compare the two uh, in this study. And in the end, uh, I will make a sort of brief conclusion. And of course, it's just a start to uh, study hadronization in uh, uh, charge correlation. And I'll give an outlook of how this work can be extended to future work. And uh, uh, so here is a quick slice for hadronization 101 in case uh, uh, not everybody knows what I mean by hadronization. So uh, it targets uh, the uh, description of degrees of freedom from partons to hadrons. And uh, uh, so we know QCD uh, is quantum chromodynamics, it's a CU3 color uh, quantum field theory, the fundamental degrees of freedom are quarks and gluons. On the other hand, we also know that in the final stage, we have pions, kions, all those non-elementary particles, which are uh, believed to be uh, composite objects from uh, quarks and gluons. And uh, so to describe the hadron distribution, uh, if you want to use QCD, then necessarily you have to talk about something called hadronization that's sort of obvious. And one thing I do want to point out is that, uh, um, so uh, uh, fundamentally, uh, quarks and gluons are not matched with hadrons at all. So the degrees of reasons are different, one is uh, Elementary particles forming on both, and we spin one half and one, and they are colored. And in the end, you have to color neutralize the whole thing and then combine all this fundamental degrees of freedom in the way that uh, you get hadrons, which uh, are, can have many excited states. So you can imagine that, oh, this must be extremely complicated and non calculable at all. But in fact, there are certain non perturbative features that uh, are less sensitive to say the hadron mass or 
some uh, uh, like more details uh, properties of hadrons, but still non preservative and uh, very interesting to study. And let me just get a bit more serious about hadronization models uh, and give you a sort of outline how people tend to uh, understand the uh, hadron distribution in collider physics. So on the left hand side here, uh, I sort of schematically draw a uh, say quark jets and then I put the quark line on the left mouse and then arrange gluons emissions all on the right hand side just to sort of uh, uh, cleanly uh, organize the drawing. And uh, so the left hand side, of course, is Patanik's sort of understanding of how jets form. And uh, 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 so there are certain properties that may persist at uh, uh, finite NC, but for the rest of this talk, let me assume just uh, go to the large NC limits and it's easier for me to talk about some hadronization prescriptions. So in the large NC limits, you can represent quarks and gluon lines all by uh, the sort of this uh, blue color lines. And uh, 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 you will see that uh, there, there are color flows everywhere. And then in the end, uh, uh, you have quarks and gluons in the uh, later stage of the pattern shower. So what we do is that uh, at that stage, typically turned off at around one GeV, there are finite number of quarks and gluons. Then what do we do? We, we have to find a prescription of turning that into hadrons. And there are two main uh, uh, hadronization model. One is the so-called string-based models, which is implemented in PCA. The string model is the most uh, uh, famous one. The other one is called a cluster model. And I will sort of briefly describe them in this slide. And uh, uh, so for the string models, uh, uh, it's based on uh, lattice QCD uh, uh, calculations that we have linear confinements and uh, uh, we cannot uh, allow quarks to separate uh, uh, infinitely far away. And then the energies that uh, between the uh, quark pairs has to uh, 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 localize and then the string has to break to turn into hadrons. They're sort of the basic assumptions of the string models. So you can see from this illustration, I draw some uh, uh, yellow uh, sort of lines. And these are what I mean by strings that uh, connect the final pattern shower results of quarks and gluons, connect with strings. And then later, the, these strings will just fly away and then uh, breaks. When they are too long, they will just break and then turn into hadrons. And then details of this uh, uh, string hadronization is not very important here, but I just want to let you know that uh, uh, there are some prescription uh, that allow us to uh, uh, sort of uh, organize final state patterns in a way that turn into hadrons. On the other hand, there's another class of hadronization model called cluster models. And then uh, it's uh, also uh, sort of similar in the sense that uh, uh, the color flows uh, are uh, uh, picked out in the way that is very uh, close to what a string of uh, hadronization is doing. But uh, the cluster models uh, has uh, extra steps, which uh, relies on some uh, properties, what we call pre-confinement. It is sort of saying that uh, uh, the angular order pattern shower has uh, properties that uh, in the end of the pattern shower, the, uh, the, the large NC uh, 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 color uh, uh, QQ bar pair that can be formed uh, uh, color neutral uh, clusters has to be so, so sort of local in the sense that uh, uh, once uh, you form those clusters, it doesn't really matter how many clusters you are forming. And then those uh, properties uh, doesn't scale with uh, the, the uh, cluster multiplicity uh, too much. And in the end, you have some uh, uh, converged uh, cluster mass distribution. But uh, uh, you can sort of make an analogy between the strings and the cluster. And then you can see from this illustration that almost always uh, you see some strings connect to cross and glue ones. And then those color uh, singlet uh, pairs can also in another model form clusters. Uh, uh, and then those clusters will decay into final state hadrons. OK, so there's a lot of descriptions about hadronization model in this slice. But the bottom line is that there are 
a few models that we have been using throughout decades. And uh, uh, that has been implemented in PCR and Herwig and Sherpa, but uh, uh, string and cluster models are the dominant ones that we use and they mesh uh, data pretty well. And uh, so obvious question is, is there a way to distinguish the two or, or further refine uh, either of the model? So uh, before I proceed to the main uh, content of the work, I want to emphasize again, the challenges we are facing when you want to study heteronization, which is that uh, uh, you can see from this, say, uh, uh, event display, uh, event uh, illustration that you have to see final state particles illustrated as green uh, uh, dots. There are so many of them, and uh, there are so many particles in your events. And when you say you want to study hegemonization, it's really uh, asking for some observer that can help you more concretely pin down any of the microscopic uh, mechanism in this uh, 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 illustration. And uh, there are some guiding principles, of course. Say if you have too very much energy, you are going to just produce so many particles, and uh, uh, soon you will be overwhelmed with that particle multiplicity and it's hard to capture the whole physics all at once. And the obvious uh, uh, case is that uh, in heavy ion collisions, we create so many uh, particles through the underlying events and then the QGP uh, uh, still hasn't been uh, uh, able to be described in this uh, uh, framework at all. And we still need to rely on hydrodynamic uh, simulations to understand those particles. But uh, you can see that uh, uh, hydronization study can be extremely complicated if we don't have a guiding principle of going to this. And uh, as I mentioned in the title page, I want to distinguish our work with some other approaches from the stars that uh, uh, they are definitely very systematic and uh, uh, useful ways of understanding aspect of uh, non parity QCD and hydronization. One, of course, is the very famous uh, 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 objects, fragmentation functions that's in the all, almost all the hadron cross-section factorization theorems that were in our calculations. So the, the most common one is the inclusive hadron fragmentation, which is usually depicted as a D. And uh, in looking into these subjects, uh, I ran into Xinyan's uh, work uh, almost 20 years ago uh, that uh, works on dihedron uh, fermentation function. And uh, uh, this is uh, the next step of a systematic uh, quantification of hadron distributions. And then all these tools are uh, uh, using uh, inclusive uh, single hadrons or inclusive dihedrons. And, uh, uh, and I want to say that uh, uh, you are going to see that uh, we are going to the opposite direction that's being highly exclusive for picking only the two particles. The other uh, areas of hegemonization studies, of course, is to study how hegemonization affect, say some out country observer like uh, um, event shapes or just substructure observables. And uh, those are uh, what typically is called hegemonization correction. And then that is not discussed in our, uh, this work because uh, uh, we mainly focus on the microscopic details of all the Hegemonization dynamics. So, okay, let's start talking about what we do now. And uh, so, uh, as I said, there are so many particles. So I want to sort of pay more attention to a subset of the particles. So I want to look at jets and uh, those uh, dominant energy flows in the events. So I will first construct a jet. And not only I look at the particle inside the jet, but I also want to just look at two particles inside the jet which is the leading and next to leading hadron, which I uh, denote as H1 and H2. And I will convince you very soon in the later slides why these two particles are interesting. And since there are two particles, it's a uh, two particle uh, kinematic correlations, we can have say the momentum fraction Z of the softer hadrons or the angle between the two or the relative K perp, which are typical uh, ways of quantifying these uh, two particle correlations. And by definition, Z is between zero, uh, zero and 0.5. And uh, the, the reason why we want to look at this, uh, of course, is that uh, 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 we sort of believe that uh, uh, it's comparatively easier to understand how those 
uh, energetic patterns uh, turn into hadrons because they are very hard to deplete the energy and it has to go somewhere. And uh, so those hadron, uh, uh, pattern to hadron transition uh, seems to be a natural uh, candidate to uh, have a, a pure and a simplistic uh, uh, description. So we, we focus on that. And also uh, uh, echoing again, the, the all the abundance of particles problems in the events that we want to avoid all this because there are many sources for these soft particles. And then it's really, really hard to disentangle, disentangle the origin of these particles. It can come from ISR from initial state partons. It can come from final state radiation from other jets or any other places, uh, quarks and gluons that can emit wide angle soft radiation or even underlying events. So we want to avoid that and then uh, go into some kinematic region or, or uh, uh, phase space that uh, we think can uh, uh, most uh, honestly represent some intrinsic property of heteronization. And uh, so uh, pick out as, uh, the leading and excluding hadrons and uh, 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 which means that we need a very good uh, uh, particle identification. So the whole uh, context uh, in our work uh, is to first start with uh, the future electron ion collider, which has the following very good properties. And one thing is that uh, ES is not too energetic, which is good. And it is also not too, too low energy. And it's also very good that can have some productivity to freedom for us to study hadronization. And it's also having tunable beam energy. So it's almost perfect. And uh, we, as I said, uh, we don't want a very, very energetic colliders uh, to have too many productive emissions to overwhelm the everything. So uh, we uh, 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 realize that the EIC is really a good uh, um, uh, uh, playground for all these studies. And or if, even if we want to uh, study uh, hydronization at a higher energy collider like LHC or future colliders, uh, the equivalent statement would be we want to find an observable that is di not directly affected by uh, soft emissions, which is also uh, 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 echoing why uh, leading and next leading hadrons are interesting. And uh, uh, ESC is now detector uh, concept is now being developed and finalized. And then we really need excellent particle identification for these uh, studies. And uh, uh, there are future uh, uh, possibility of refining hydronization, understanding with dependence on spin and polarization and uh, target hydronization is also very new in this context. So I just want to point out that uh, uh, hydronization studies uh, has uh, uh, a very bright future uh, because we, have, we are going to have a new machine. And also uh, uh, we have an existing machine that is uh, also very promising that the build to uh, data should be able to allow us to illuminate uh, some properties of hadronization that uh, was not uh, quantified that precisely before. Okay, so uh, leading and next leading hadron assume that we can take those and now let's look into how they behave and then how we uh, uh, want to study them. And uh, so here uh, uh, we uh, define a ratio called charge correlation ratio, ratio R sub C, uh, which is a way to quantify the difference between the cross section uh, that have leading and next leading to H1, H2, and uh, the other uh, counterpart is H1 and H2 bar. Uh, the way we want to do this is that we want to understand uh, uh, condition on the fact that we have a, a leading particle H1 what's the probability or conditional probability of having H2 or H2 bar near H1. Then we want to uh, get some insights of uh, uh, this uh, flavor constraints in uh, hydronization. And this idea is totally not uh, new. And it has been, uh, uh, similar ideas have been approached uh, uh, many years ago by Tassel at DAISY and also CERN ISR and LAB fixed target experiment and, uh, uh, and even heavy ion, uh, 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 similar concept called the balance function was used to study the hadronization uh, uh, differences uh, between uh, heavy ion collisions and uh, proton collisions. 
So uh, the, but, uh, the bottom line is that for this ratio, we want to contrast uh, the uh, existence of the H2 or H2 bar in the presence of H1. So the conditional probability of the two part, uh, the leading dihedron is the key here. And I, I want to remind you that uh, we use a convention which puts a plus sign, a uh, positive uh, sign in front of uh, uh, sigma H1, H2 for the same sign H1, H2. So you are going to see that uh, uh, with this convention and then later uh, that uh, the tendency of H1 and H2 uh, uh, to bar to be dominant, the RC is mostly negative. You are going to see in uh, the later simulation studies. And there's a limit in which this RC is very interesting that when RC has approached uh, minus one, which means that uh, the opposite sign cross-section dominates, then the, the, we uh, uh, can uh, achieve the most flavor constraints that are uh, uh, dictating the, the other H2 uh, to be totally opposite sign with H1. On the other hand, if H1, H2 are uh, uh, produced independently, what people call many years ago, uh, independent hadronization, then the sign of H2 or H2 bar doesn't really matter for this ratio. So the RC should be close to zero. So we are going to use this RC as a, a, a criteria for us to uh, know whether there's strong flavor constraints or whether there's little flavor constraint. And uh, 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 I want to point out uh, again that um, the charge correlation idea is not new. But uh, there are two novelties. Let me remind you again. The first is to uh, look at leading and uh, next leading uh, hadrons. And the other is would be to study this RC as a function of just substructure observable, which uh, uh, includes uh, the momentum fraction and um, transverse momentum and, and formation time. Later, I will uh, talk about this. And the, the rest of the study is kind of straightforward that uh, so we will prepare some Monte Carlo samples and try to uh, look into the differences between the two samples. And then we use the uh, highest design energy for the EIC, so which is the asymmetric 18 GeV electron beam and 275 GeV for the proton beam. And uh, 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 we take two uh, simulations one is uh, PCR, the other one is Hurwick. PCR is based on a uh, lone string model, Hurwick based on cluster model to contrast the two hadronization models. And uh, we specifically take PCR6 uh, for quite a convenience, but we also use uh, PCR8 uh, to cross check the results. And uh, the Hurwick 7.1.5 was used and uh, uh, but we haven't uh, uh, checked uh, with the update for 7.2, which uh, will be a uh, cross-check uh, later uh, in this work. But uh, the, 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 um, the basic difference between hadronization model will persist uh, even with uh, different other versions. And uh, in this work, uh, we still want some sort of perturbative degrees of freedom around some non perturbative system. So we, impose a Q square greater than 50 GeV square uh, to make sure that uh, the momentum transfer is quite kind of hard, that uh, the jets get deflected as sort of high PT jets can have some, at least one or two hard Coulomb emissions or, or zero if you are not so lucky. But uh, uh, not just that, uh, uh, we have very low particle multiplicity. And uh, we make sure that we have enough statistics to have uh, accurate uh, measurements and uh, uh, conclusions from simulation results. So uh, which this 10 million events only accounts for just 1% uh, of the integrated luminosity in projected EIC uh, studies. So which is not totally achievable in future uh, data taking. And uh, I do want to point out that uh, 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 we impose PT jet cut again above 5 GV just to make sure that we are sort of high PT. And uh, in this kinematic selections, uh, you can imagine that we have a hard deflection of balance bar that can do to jets. And it's safe to assume that uh, what we are looking at are those 
either uh, up quark jets or down quark jets uh, at this certain energy. And how do they part and shower and hydronize? And then how do we study the hydronization inside these jets? And uh, uh, let me first point out to you that the leading dihedron kinematic is really kind of interesting. So uh, the, on the left-hand side, you can see the Z distribution. Z is the momentum fraction of the soft hadron. And uh, the other distribution is the caper, uh, uh, which is the relative uh, momentum of the uh, dihedron. You can see that this Z distribution maximize at Z equal to one, uh, 0.5. And uh, the probability of Z having a small value is very low. And, and this is uh, very interesting. That is uh, totally, in some sense, opposite to some perturbative expectation if uh, any of the leading hadrons come from uh, productive emissions and turn into hadron like a lower right corner uh, scenario. And uh, also for the caper, uh, we see that uh, the caper is very, very low as a characteristic scale, almost below one GeV. And uh, uh, but still there are some uh, kinematic region that is above one that it can um, be a bit perturbative, but uh, overall this K curve is uh, sitting, uh, peaking around some uh, values that is uh, very close to non probative physics. So uh, this dihedron kinematic distribution is uh, interesting and pointed to some possible pictures of the origin of this dihedron. And uh, you may now start to sort of guess, oh, do this dihedron just come from a cluster in a cluster model, or just from a breaking of the string if we were in the string model? But in either case, uh, let's assume that this dihedron really come from some non perverted process in this uh, 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 collision. And uh, I, uh, in the sort of this uh, uh, blue uh, 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 box here, uh, I sort of give you a, a picture that is very uh, consistent of the, what we observe for the Z and K per distribution. So if in the rest brand of this H1 and H2, if it makes perfect sense, then the, the H1 and H2 momentum scale should just be the K per. And, uh, and uh, you can see that it's a non polluted scale. And if we boost this system uh, to the energy of the H1 and H2 that we observe in the left, what we are going to see is that uh, the, it's necessarily uh, uh, implying that the energy of the H1 and H2 has to be sort of comparable and not hierarchically different or even suppressed uh, like one over Z or enhanced by one over Z. And uh, uh, this picture, you can check this by going into different energy machines like a uh, LED or LC. And you are going to see that this k per distribution is sort of remain similar. And uh, the angle between this uh, H1 and H2 will get uh, smaller if we were at a higher uh, energy machine. So uh, it's really that uh, com quite convincing that uh, the leading dihedron is really picking out some uh, non perverted ingredient of whatever hadronization model that is uh, uh, using to, to produce these two particles. And uh, 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 so, uh, with this uh, understanding, uh, uh, there's a, a, another way of thinking about uh, the dihedron kinematics distribution by looking at uh, exactly how it behaves in the left frame. So, uh, so if, again, if di this dihedron really comes from uh, some non perverted system, then the, we could talk about the formation time of this system and uh, how it will say either decay into this two di uh, the dihedron or string break into this dihedron. And the formation time is uh, proportional to the intrinsic proper time, which is about one over k per. And you can think that this is a non perpetuity scale roughly, and also boosted by how uh, energetic these two uh, the hadrons are uh, in the left frame. And uh, from on the left hand side, there are two plots. One is showing the for the same sign, H1 and H2 have either plus plus or minus minus. There's a typo here. And uh, the other plus is showing for the opposite sign. You can see that th these two uh, distribution peak around one to 10 Fermi. And uh, 
uh, one firm is roughly like has a non-perfect scale, 10 firm is a bit long, but now we understand that there's a boost. So sort of uh, very consistent with the picture that uh, uh, there's a non-perfect uh, length scale that is dilated by this Lorentz, Lorentz uh, factor. And you can see that uh, uh, with different uh, uh, particle identification for either the pions or kions and proton, antiprotons, the cross sections are very different. And uh, for the kions and proton, antiprotons, the, uh, the uh, cross section in this log scale can have uh, auto magnitude differences, which uh, hints that uh, uh, the opposite sign uh, cross section will dominate. If we take uh, the uh, uh, charge correlation ratios and then plot the RC as a function of formation time, yes, uh, uh, it results in the right-hand side plot. And towards the right is a large formation time. And that means the uh, uh, extremely collinear dihedrons and uh, very small uh, k perp. On the uh, left, in the left limits is a very small formation time, which typically means say, uh, uh, hard emission wide angle and uh, the, uh, the emission will quickly decorrelate in, in that uh, um, uh, limit. And between the two, there's a transition regions that uh, um, uh, going from non perturbative uh, uh, regions to perturbative regions. And then we see that uh, if we plot both PCR and uh, Hervey on the same plot, you see that it looks like uh, in the non perturbative regions, uh, uh, the two as comparable correlation uh, strengths, which uh, what I mean is that the absolute uh, value of this RC. And, but uh, when it goes to uh, the, uh, the more perturbative region, you see that the uh, string-based uh, uh, models sort of uh, retain the correlation uh, more than the cluster uh, hazardization models. So in some sense, this cluster hazardization model is more local, meaning that if you have uh, a bit larger uh, uh, emission, uh, wide angle emission and harder emissions, very quickly, there is going to be no cluster formed for this uh, uh, pattern uh, pairs. And then uh, uh, this uh, uh, RC as a function of T form clearly shows that uh, we will be able to uh, 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 be sensitive to the details of the hegemonizing models that is used in these simulations. And there are significant uh, differences among the two, between the two also. And a more direct uh, way of looking at this, uh, 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 um, the charge correlations is in terms of the dependence on CAPER, because CAPER is really the uh, uh, directly related to the amount of very physics if we were very small. So you see that on this on the left hand side, uh, uh, the k perp uh, 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 RC versus k perp plots. You see that the correlation maximizes as k perp approaches uh, zero. Again, uh, very consistent with the picture that's uh, in the non perusy region, we should have uh, the largest uh, flavor correlations. And then this uh, uh, correlation quickly depletes to zero uh, when we increase the caper a bit above one GeV. And then, um, uh, yeah, these two are not superimposed on each other, but you can sort of uh, see that for a hurry uh, cluster models, at least with the parameters implemented in this version, you see that uh, the, uh, the correlation depletes much faster not measure uh, significantly faster than the um, uh, uh, string-based uh, models uh, implemented in PCI6. And uh, with this, uh, we can uh, uh, definitely uh, be sensitive to intrinsic uh, parameters in these hazardization models, and then uh, will help us to uh, 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 string test uh, these uh, uh, models uh, in the market. And uh, um, uh, this uh, is another evidence that uh, uh, there are strong uh, non perturbative correlations among the dihedra. And then there are also some uh, uh, scaling behavior for this uh, charge correlation. Uh, for this slide, uh, I'm going to show you that uh, uh, the RC is almost uh, uh, independent of the hard scale. 
And uh, um, uh, so the left plot shows large Z versus Q square, which is the DIS Q square. And the right is the PTJ. They are very much uh, correlated, uh, related to each other. So, uh, but and both point to the same uh, uh, picture that uh, uh, RC is independent of this hard scale. And uh, uh, this again, very consistent with the fact that uh, if the charge correlation picks out the non prerogative uh, um, uh, uh, aspect of hadronization, the more Q squared or the, that, or the more energy or the less energy in the events, just to pick out uh, more or less partonic digital freedoms around this non perturbative system, which is not playing a dominant role of affecting how this hadronization uh, uh, happens if hadronization really, in some sense, happens locally. <laughs> And uh, uh, this perfect, almost flat uh, uh, RC dependence on uh, hard scale uh, echoes what is practically implemented in uh, uh, string or uh, cluster-based models because uh, this uh, typically in the string models, they uh, start from the rest frame of the string and then uh, boost the string uh, kinematics to match the uh, on the partonics degree of freedom in partner shower. So um, uh, there's a like a building uh, boost invariance in uh, many of these um, MC simulations, which uh, is uh, clearly related to the scaling of this Q square and PT jet that we see uh, from these uh, two plots. And in reality, we don't know what's the answer. So we'll be very uh, interested to look at the real data and see if this uh, charge correlation is uh, totally independent of the hard scale. And then our guess is that, again, we don't do, we haven't done any uh, sort of uh, concrete calculation for this, but uh, our guess is that uh, with uh, perturbative emissions that uh, 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 around this uh, uh, dihedron system, just like a dick leg evolution, uh, that uh, there must be at least logarithmic uh, scaling behavior for this RC. So uh, future uh, measurements of this RC uh, versus this uh, high scale will tell us something about uh, the, how the non perturbative system scales with uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the energy scale. Okay, and in the later part of my talk, I want to point out some tools or tricks that we can use to uh, uh, sort of go into some more exclusive regions of hadronization and then study uh, even finer details of uh, hadronization models. So the idea is that uh, let's so use some tagging for the flavor in order for us to know more sure about uh, what uh, up or down or strange part is at play for producing certain hadrons. And uh, so, so let me show you the result first. And then in the next slide, I'm going to show you some uh, reasoning why we want to do this and then why there's a, a, a sense that uh, um, this uh, charge correlation will uh, point out a, a, a preference for either a cluster model or a string based model. <laughs> So the idea is that uh, uh, we look at pi k correlation. The reason why we, we take pi k, not just pi pi or kk, is that uh, um, uh, for pi pi, uh, uh, all the valence parts are either u or d parts, and then they can be easily produced, knocked out from the proton or uh, created in vacuum very easily. So uh, it's really hard to tag how the flavor flows if we are just looking at pi pi. But uh, uh, the, for the K, it's comparatively easier because uh, if we know there's a K, then there must be a strange quark. So uh, we want to use this K as a knob to tag or constrain some flavor in this uh, hydronization studies, and then use that to constrain either the string or uh, uh, has, uh, cluster hydronization behavior. And uh, the object we are looking at is uh, the, the, in the bottom that uh, we want to distinguish two cases. One is that, uh, let's say the leading particle is a pi minus. And then we look at uh, the probability of 
having a K plus or K minus around this pi minus. So the uh, charge correlation ratio here will be defined as fixing the leading particle to be the pi minus and then tell the difference between the next two leading to be K plus or K minus. And the other uh, case is that uh, if, we, if the leading particles to be a pi plus, then the, let's see what's the probability differences to have a K plus or a K minus around this pi plus. So there's another RC, which is the, uh, the written here, having the leading particle fixed as a pi plus, and then look at the, uh, the flavor constraints to have pi, a K plus or K minus around this pi plus. And uh, again, we define this and then go straight to implementation and looking at in simulations and then this is what we get. On the right hand side uh, is the RC uh, for both these uh, uh, two cases. And uh, one is uh, plotted as black, the other one is plotted as red. And then the left hand side is for the Hurley and right hand side is for the PST. And then we see that this charge correlation, uh, that's the flavor constraint for leading particle to be a, um, a pi plus is very different from the flavor constraint that if you were have the leading particle to be a pi minus. So we see a significant difference uh, between this flavor constraint uh, for the PCR simulations. On the other hand, for the Hurwick simulations, uh, this flavor constraint is not hierarchical in the sense that what we see in the PCR simulation, we see uh, for the Hurwick simulation, this uh, charge correlation uh, even cross each other. And then there's not a, a clear difference between the uh, strengths of the charge correlation if even taking uh, the leading particle to be a pi plus or pi minus. And this uh, difference is very significant. And, uh, uh, and then uh, we'll maintain, even if we have uh, um, uh, like a realistic uh, um, uh, detector uh, uh, limitations, like uh, uh, acceptance and detector uh, effects and all that, we use a EIC smear uh, uh, package to simulate how, what would be the quality of this measurement in future EIC. And we still see that there's a, a strong uh, uh, separation between the charge correlation among these tagged uh, flavor correlations. And then we're really looking forward to future uh, 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 measurements to see uh, if we can uh, confirm or disapprove some certain aspect of PCR or her weak uh, hydronization models. And uh, we need IK separation for these studies, of course. And then uh, this uh, will be uh, uh, some inputs for ESC detector consideration. And uh, the, the reason why we want to tag with uh, leading particle as a pi plus, pi minus, uh, and uh, having uh, this sort of sensitivity to how much of the flavor constraint we have can be understood from sort of this simple uh, flavor flow uh, uh, diagram, let me call it this way. It's not a Feynman diagram. It almost looks like a part of the Feynman diagram, but there's no calculation yet uh, associated with this diagram. So let me not call them Feynman diagrams. I use this only to show you that the flavor flow uh, will match and then allow us to understand which um, uh, hadron, dihedron channels is uh, favored by string or um, uh, cluster hydronization models. So uh, for the jets that we consider here, uh, they're mostly uh, struck quark jets, so either a U quark or a D quark. And uh, the initial coming partons get struck out and uh, the color string connects from the initial parton to the final struck quark it's too far, so we, let's not consider that and then focus on the locally, maybe another uh, perturbative or non perturbative gluon emissions uh, that uh, is responsible for this hydronization uh, subprocess. And since we want the chaos, then this gluon has to split into an SS bar or later some string uh, breaking or cluster decay has to create an SS bar. But here, let me uh, show you that uh, uh, the splitting of gluon to SS bar will be uh, sufficient for us to understand why uh, the pi minus uh, 
uh, K uh, correlation will uh, be uh, the charge correlation will be different from if we will take the leading particles to be a pi plus. And uh, there are flavor contents of the pi plus to be U D bar and K plus to be U S bar here. And then uh, it's a very simple exercise to go through all this. And then you're going to see that uh, out of this four combination, pi plus minus and K plus minus, there's only one combination, pi minus K plus, to allow a, a sensible, simple string connection and breaking that can produce this pi minus K plus. And uh, uh, the other, all the other cases needs a uh, more complicated string configuration, meaning that uh, more strings to store energies, more breakings, et cetera. So they are uh, energy and uh, fa phase space uh, sort of more disfavored. So uh, the, the dominant uh, the channel would be this pi minus K plus. The other all cases are all uh, sort of suppressed. And uh, because of this, when we take the, uh, the charge correlation ratio contrasting these two, uh, there are significant differences between these two cross section, cross section, but contrasting this to the other uh, um, uh, uh, charge correlation, we will have less uh, of the difference. And then this, let me go back to the previous slide. This can be seen from the string-based PCR results that uh, for the black, that uh, taking leading particle to be a pi plus, the charge correlation is significantly less, uh, less than the one that you take with a pi minus, and uh, which is what we are expecting from this flavor chart flow uh, in this slide. And uh, let me just also remind you that the for the case of uh, KK, uh, uh, K plus K minus uh, correlations, uh, the allowed uh, flavor chart, flavor flow, uh, flow chart that can uh, allow a simple string configuration to, uh, to produce this uh, two uh, leading hadrons is the following. That you have a uh, strong U quark, and again, productive or non productive gluon emissions split to UU bar. This uh, simple string SS bar will allow you to uh, create uh, this, uh, um, uh, this K plus K minus pair. And uh, but these are string-based models, but how about cluster models? And will cluster model predict the same thing? And uh, if you look into that and then see that uh, uh, the middle two plots are not uh, uh, are suppressed in the large NC millimeters because uh, this um, this uh, strange S is uh, is not uh, ordered in the way that is uh, uh, have a color planar diagram. So uh, these two are naturally suppressed in uh, in the large NC limits. So the the this uh, um, uh, um, oh, which means that uh, we we'll, we will have to rearrange this uh, flavor diagram to have different uh, cluster um, or string connections uh, to uh, allow these hadrons to production to be happening. But for this uh, leftmost uh, flavor diagram, it's actually allowed in, uh, in the uh, cluster uh, hadronization model because you see in the large density limits, this color flow matches. It's just that the, this color singlet uh, 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 die QQ bar cluster is not charged neutral. It's actually charged. It's a combination of a U and an S bar. And uh, so because of this, and also because uh, in the string case, strings are neutral, and then there's no way to uh, uh, link the two with a string and then break it and turn into pi plus pi, uh, K plus. But in the cluster uh, hydronization model, this uh, color singlet uh, cluster can actually form and then decay into pi plus and k, uh, k plus. So that's the difference between a uh, string and a uh, cluster hydronization model that is applied to pi k correlation. So I say a lot of words. So I hope that is all uh, makes sense to you without concrete equation, but uh, and uh, I do apologize that uh, at the moment, uh, um, uh, we 
are trying to find some strategy of uh, enhancing this qualitative understanding of hydrogenization models. But uh, we do believe that uh, this gives us start to, to look into how we can sensibly uh, uh, contrast uh, different hydrogenization model instead of running PCR ones, running hurry ones, look at some observable, just look at the outcome of the difference. So that's not very concrete how we can systematically uh, improve hydronization models. We hope that uh, by looking at dihedron uh, correlations we will be sort of more concrete to look at certain observable that can allow us to uh, uh, design some strategies to, to pin down uh, hydronization model parameters or the intrinsic properties of it. So let me conclude that uh, uh, leveling dihedron correlation is really sort of natural and uh, uh, special candidates for hydronization studies because it's non perturbative and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, very energetic, so it's kind of unique. And uh, the tagging of these two will have detector limitations, but it's uh, more concretely uh, defined other than uh, compared to having to look at so many soap particles all at once. And uh, besides energy tagging, flavor tagging has to be a, a powerful tool for studying hydronization because we care a lot about that. And uh, there's something that we, I don't uh, emphasize, but uh, at the scale when parton turn into hadrons, uh, the strange um, quark mass is at play for strange suppression and all that. So all these uh, are sensitive to very low scale uh, uh, either the mass or energy scale virtuality. So uh, we are entering into a region of having to rely heavily on uh, some non theoretical physics to explain all this. And uh, the, the key to the success of this program has to rely on the particle identification we can do in future uh, machine, which I hope that uh, we will be able to uh, uh, make the best detector we can at EIC. And uh, um, the evolution of the dihedron uh, correlation to kinematic variables gives a sort of novel way of thinking about just substructure as a evolution parameter or evolution variable for transition between productive and non productive physics. And uh, uh, this concept is uh, general in the sense that uh, uh, so uh, to echo what is the true meaning of hydronization. Hydronization is the uh, uh, transition or mapping from partonic state to hydronic state. Therefore, it's a mapping that you have to care about the partonic uh, parton distribution of the final state quarks and gluons in order for you to understand uh, the final hydron distribution. And then we do want to disentangle the perturbative uh, contribution that we can calculate and then extract those non perturbative transition. So uh, the study of a purely non perturbative uh, object, which is the dihedron correlation, and study its relation to a, a intrinsically perturbative origin, like a just substructure observable or some IRC safe observable, will allow us to uh, go between these two regimes uh, more concretely. And the outlook of this work, uh, one uh, concrete direction is to extend Xinian's work and uh, Abhijit's work to uh, have a concrete uh, 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 perturbative understanding of these non perturbative objects. And I think this uh, is worth investigating and we'll look into that. And then uh, we'll invite a collaboration, of course. And, uh, uh, and there also, as I said, that uh, mm, the the interesting thing about studying non perturbative objects, just like the pattern distribution function, femination function, people talk about evolution. So even though they are non perturbative uh, uh, objects, we still want to know how uh, to interface that with perturbative uh, components. So uh, there's, a, there's an ongoing project uh, to correlate the leading dihedrons to subjects, which are perturbative emissions. And uh, so stay tuned for a longer future paper that come out to incorporate this. And also uh, uh, all this 
Monte Carlo studies are Monte Carlos with building known physics. And then the most exciting part will, of course, to see this in real data. So uh, we're also working on trying to see if we could take uh, archive H1 data and then see something there. And uh, um, uh, I propose that uh, this charge correlation can be a very robust and interesting observable, easier to tag, very concrete uh, to define, also for heavy ion studies. And then this two dihedron correlation, kinematic correlation will allow us to see if this non-produced system passing through the QGP will be affected in a way that we haven't been, talk about, haven't been talking about before. So thank you. That's all what I want to say today. Thank you, uh, uh, Yanjin. Thank you for the talk. So now we have, uh, you know, some few minutes for question and, and comments from the audience. And I see uh, Kai, please go ahead. Hey, Yanjin, thank you for the talk. Um, do, so if I remember the pi plus and pi minus and k plus k minus, those correlations were are hard scale independent, right? But yeah. in the pi plus and k minus those pairs, there there is quite a bit of dependence in the hard scale. So, can you explain why that is, or maybe you explained it already? But no, so I, I didn't explain this. But uh, um, the um, so let me try to contrast this with uh, another plot. So the the evolution of this correlation, at least to me and uh, all my collaborators, is more striking as a say a function of say for example k prop. You can clearly see that in certain limit is maximum, and then it oops, and then it quickly just uh, uh, goes uh, to zero very quickly when we crank up the k uh, uh, perp. And uh, on the other hand, for this. I do agree with you that uh, there are sort of slope that uh, go from left, lower left to upper right, and then, and then similarly for the other trend. But uh, um, I think uh, at the, this moment, it is uh, we haven't been making concrete uh, uh, statement about whether there's a interesting dependence of this um, uh, uh, RC respect to this PT jets. And then it's more to me like, uh, uh, say, for if, if you see, uh, say, the, the true distribution um, for the red here. So this red is almost flat. And then for here, the black is sort of this. And uh, mm, we haven't spent much effort trying to understand this uh, tiny modulation or small transition of this RC value with respect to PT, but uh, to us it's almost also quite flat for these cases. So, so the bottom line is that we haven't tried to understand whether there's a, uh, like a non-trivial dependence of this PT jet for this case yet. Thanks. Uh, regarding to that, have you maybe just tried to test the robustness of this by ch changing um, the leading hadron to be k-on instead of pion and see if you get same conclusion or not? Yeah, uh, let me see. Um, but you, you would expect that to have a similar type of picture, right, as the next slide? Yes, so... Um, so the cross-section of uh, having the leading particle to be a, a pi or a k are quite uh, significantly different. So mm -hmm. if a leading particle to be a pi, there's a dominant cross-section for that. But if there are leading particle to be a k, the cross-section is uh, lower. So uh, we haven't checked that, but uh, the, for k on to, to be uh, leading particles, there are certain other uh, possibilities too. So let me go to this. So here, the reason why I only talk about some gluon emission to SS bar, and then not talk about say uh, S uh, knock out from a uh, C quad S not knock, knock out from a proton is that uh, 
there are certainly some cross section that you can have a energetic S quark turn into a K on. And uh, in fact, uh, if you go through the, the flavor uh, flow uh, chart, the scenario over there is a bit different from what we have here. So uh, we, um, I don't remember we have looked into this uh, um, uh, leading to be a K and then the next leading to be other, let's say pi. And even though this cross section is lower, we should still, uh, it's interesting to look into that. But uh, uh, we haven't looked into that and then we will look into that uh, following your suggestion. All right, thank you. Okay, um, well, maybe see, let me, if, uh, when we, maybe there's other question and comments. Uh, yeah. Let me ask this first. Uh, have you ever considered the um, media modification of this, uh, of this uh, correlations? Uh, short like answer nuclear, is, like nu nuclear target, for example. Oh, the short answer is uh, not yet. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, um, I didn't. Oh, the, the short answer is uh, we haven't looked into uh, oh, okay. uh, yeah. this. And as we we had simulation studies to use Beagle for uh, electron ion collider, but uh, uh, we uh, hesitate to include that into this current uh, um, uh, publication because uh, even uh, Beagle is still developing. So, uh, the mm -hmm. conclusion that we may see there is may not be uh, robustly tested uh, in the sense that the uh, simulation is tuned well to many of the things that we know. So, but uh, beyond that, we 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 don't we haven't looked into analytically or even think about what would be the physical mechanism of changing this uh, um, dihedral correlation yet. Right. But it's an interesting question. Yeah, I think uh, as I said in the well, the, the dihon correlation itself, if you don't if you don't uh, consider flavor dependence, that uh, you know, Abhijit and I already looked at this some time ago, and, uh, and recently uh, we all uh, who has you know gone to just uh, argon now also now. Uh, have reproduced this kind of modification of the dihydron correlation due to the energy loss, which oh. uh, for me is very, at the time is uh, the, the reason why we consider looking at dihydron correlation because uh, uh, different scenario of jet quenching will have different uh, result because uh, you can imagine if, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, in particular, the pardon energy loss was the uh, you know, uh, analy uh, uh, sort of suppression because if it is uh, if it is due to hardon uh, interaction, then you would expect the dihydron correlation will be different than, than if the pardon energy loss because the both uh. part coming from the same pardon if it is low, at loss energy, that will have different modification on the dihydron correlation. I see. Yeah. But for flavors, we actually uh, look at beef, you know, just uh, some time ago about, uh, but this is only single in inclusive flavor dependence. Like if you, uh, you know, the k on versus, uh, especially the k on versus the pi on, uh, in DIS, the leading part on, the leading part on is always, uh, you know, uh, U and D quark, right? And if there is a glue induced, induced glue emission, which can split into Q bar, uh, which democratically into all flavors, for example. And, and then we actually predict that uh, there should be some different suppression for different flavor, you know, in different climatic kind of region, but uh, we never uh, look at the, uh, the flavor correlation. So in this case, in your case, maybe uh, it will be interesting to look at that too. Yeah. Sounds interesting, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I do have in mind that uh, this um, may be very useful for heavy ion studies. And uh, so the, the whole hope, of course, is um, mm, uh, the, 
the dilemma we are having right now that uh, uh, there are not much much modification for substructure, but there are suppression for uh, cross section. And then we are finding a hard time trying to extract some concrete signals from substructure modification. And uh, so that led me to think that maybe uh, a possibility is to uh, look at the very extremely energetic components, those collinear components, more than the soft component that can affect uh, mm -hmm. very easily by other things, and then even by underlying event subtraction and all that. So, uh, so a while ago, I, I worked with some collaborators on some sort of very collinear axis called winner take all axis. And then there's a hope that on, if it were defective, maybe say something more concretely about uh, gem media interaction. And similarly here, uh, the, uh, of course, I, I saw your uh, uh, work, uh, the dihedron modification in heavy ion. And then the immediate uh, idea is to use, to, to look at the leading dihedron uh, modification. And the uh, idea is again similar that, oh, these two are very energetic. I'm more, I feel safer to uh, have a, uh, not a uh, graph of this uh, system. And then if there are any of the um, modification to this system, I can say something concrete. Instead, the, my, my worry about say the general dihedron correlation would be, say if there are very soft hedron that uh, you, you need to know whether it's the underlying event particle or if it were a, truly a jet particle, uh, practically it's very, very hard for us to make a concrete sort of determination of, oh, if it were just some fluctuation from the background or something else. But, but it's, it doesn't say that it's uh, not, uh, not achievable, but it's, it's, I think it's very significantly more challenging than uh, say looking at say leading dihedron that is both energetic, uh, standing out of the background, and then we can look at maybe angle between them or whatever. So some sort of a modification. Maybe a, a route uh, uh, beyond what uh, you have uh, looked at before, maybe. Yes, yes, okay. I, I, I saw Kong, I have some question, but he left already, so. Ah. Okay, okay, uh, I think if there is no further questions, uh, let us thank uh, Yan Ching again um, for your time and to give this talk. <laughs> oh, thank you so much again. Okay, for, uh, we will keep in touch. <laughs> and good, good to see you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.